Now, uh, let me also tell you a few other things related to this. I remember I mentioned, uh, so we, we wrote out the LP for, uh, we wrote out the LP duality theorem assuming this particular form, uh, this particular form for the primal LP that we took it as standard form, because every problem can be reduced to this sort of standard form and then you get, uh, you get it, uh, you can and this was the dual of of, of that particular of, of the standard form LP. Now, if you have a LP which is not in standard form, okay, if you have LP not in standard form, not in standard form. So, for example, say suppose you have a LP that looks like this. Say suppose you have a LP that that is say suppose this is your LP. Now, what is the dual of this one? It turns out so the way to get to the dual so this LP would all, this primal will also have a dual. Okay. Now its dual will not take the same form as the standard form dual. Its, its its dual will be uh, will take a different form, but the way to get there is that you you can convert this to standard form. Then do a dual of dual of standard form, and usually after this some manipulations are needed. Okay, some 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 because usually this will lead to number uh, some some redundant variables which you can eliminate easily and so on. Uh, do a few manipulations if if possible, and then that gives you that will give you the dual of that will give you a dual problem. Now, what is the dual of this one? It turns out it's turns out it is maximum maximizing B transpose Y. A transpose y less than equal to c and y greater than equal to c. This is the form of of the dual of of this particular LP. Okay. You can you can as I said consider many other different uh, different uh, linear programs and uh, and find their uh, find their standard fi, uh, find their duals by just converting them to this sort of sort of uh, the by converting them to standard form and then manipulations and so on. Yes, yes, yes. this is the same A as this A, the B is the same as this B, C is the same as this C. Yes, some variables will get dropped, yes, it is possible that some variables will get dropped. No, so it will come. You can bring it to bring it down to this form. So this is also another sort of settled point. See, an, an optimization problem can have many different forms that are all giving the same optimal value. Remember, at the end of the day, the duality theorem only pertains to the value of the optimization problem. That you can always introduce additional variables. You know, manipulate, remove variables, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, while not changing the optimal value. So, so there is no uh, there is no fixed form for an optimization problem. That's a matter. Of, but you, all we know is that yes, this is a form for the dual. All right. So this is uh, so this is how you can if you have a LP in uh, that is not in standard form, then you can all this is the route by which you 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 can get its dual. All right. Okay. So uh, as a last topic on linear programming, let me all let me mention to you one other thing, which is uh, which. Uh, another type of problem which comes up which can be written as a linear program uh, and that problem is the problem of shortest path so the problem that i wrote here 
in the in this in this the network problem here was that I you had an old phone and you had a new phone you want to transfer data from an old phone to the new phone, but then the links that over which the data could flow had limitations of capacity right. So, you you could not push data um, beyond a certain uh, beyond a certain uh, MB per second along these links right. So, there is a different type of problem which is uh, which origin which is of the following kind that you have a source node, you have a destination node ok, say the source node is say Mumbai and the destination node is say suppose Delhi. You have you can go from this source node to this destination node over many different possible paths. One way is that you can go till you can fly till somewhere here then you can go then you can go by uh, then take another flight and get to Delhi. You another way is that you can you can go by you can go from S to some other intermediate node then you fly till here or you then fly directly to Delhi from here. Another possibility is you can go from here to here and then go there to here etcetera etcetera etcetera. So, that you can see there are numerous possible ways by which you can go from one node uh, from from the source node to the destination node ok. So, now if you have this kind of uh, uh, if you have a, a general network like this the problem the problem which we are asked uh, what we have to what we want to ask here is what is the what is the shortest path. So, every link here suppose has a length ok the lin uh, or a length or a or a cost associated with it ok. So, the length say for every i and j ok, every i and j has a cost cost c i j okay. and these are all directed edges. There is a cost to go from i to j cost c i j i to j and what we want to know is what is the what is the root from s to t of minimum cost what is the root from s to t of minimum cost. Now, this is a problem that we we end up solving every day when we use Google maps uh, to find a route from point A to point B. This is exactly what uh, uh, Google maps is ending up solving for you. Uh, it is assuming uh, the cost as say the travel time from i to j. Now, if you are talk, uh, in if you are within the city, maybe travel time is all you care about. In in another, if when you are traveling from one uh, from uh, intercity, you are caring also about uh, also about say tolls. Maybe if you are driving on toll roads or your cost of uh, cost of a ticket, if you are changing modes of transport in between, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you can define cost in whichever way you like. The uh, the uh, so long as you are you have one consistent notion of cost this problem can be posed in this particular way ok. Now, we want to know what is the shortest uh, shortest in the sense of uh, in, the in the sense of the uh, total cost that you would incur of a uh, route from uh, S to T ok. So, the cost of a route from S to T is simply is simply the S to T is in sum of c i j where i comma j is in the is in the i comma so whenever i comma j is an edge that you use in the root you uh, it it costs you c i j ok and the cost of of the entire root is the sum of all these c i j that are where i comma j lies in the root 
this is the cost of uh, of traveling from i to j. Now, here you can see how, how uh, intuitively how would you solve a problem like this. See if you want to go from Mumbai to Delhi you can see already this simple little graph is a extremely complicated graph. Right? How would you solve a problem like this? You would say well let me go from let me try out this route one route here I go from S from I go from my uh, uh, the uh, source node to one node then I try out an from here let me try out this particular possibility, let me try out that particular possibility etcetera, etcetera. I have you basically have to enumerate a huge number of possibilities and to try to get to the shortest path. Now, that seems like a it seems like an extremely complicated optimization over so many because even just enumerating all the possible paths itself is a uh, would take you a lot of time right and then listing out listing them all out just simply enumerating all the paths and then try and then trying to f uh, find which is the one that is of least cost. Now, it turns out this can be solved using linear programming in a very, 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 very elegant manner. Okay. So, let me explain how that is, uh, how that is done. Okay. So, on the no on the roots here, now I have say if I have a node i and a node j here, I have a cost c i j listed written for that particular that particular link there. Okay. Now, I want you to before I write out the linear program, I want you to appreciate the difference between this problem which is the shortest path problem and the problem of maximum flow. The problem of shortest path is simply says I want the shortest path from go to go from S to T without, but every the when I travel on any edge in the path, any edge or any link i j on the path it cost me something, there is a certain toll or a certain fee that I have to pay, but there is the capacity is virtually infinite, like any amount of flow can go on. Okay. So, the, so the problem uh, whereas, the other problem there is no cost associated with travelling from i to j, but there is a limitation of capacity where you cannot flow send more than a certain amount of flow. So, you can think of capacity and cost as two different things. Capacity is how many cars say a road can take capacity of that road. So, the the cost of, of travelling on that road is the toll you have to pay for, for travelling on it. These are two very different things. There are finitely many nodes, yes. There are finitely many nodes that you can by which you can go and we want to know the shortest path on that particular from, from the source to a destination node. No, no, no. So, in any even in a real life problem you need to model it in such a way that uh, it brings it you have uh, you know finitely many nodes and finitely many decisions to make. Okay. So, even though there are the point is even though there are uh, there are just finitely many the number is too large if you just think of all the possible routes you can take it is uh, the number of combinations you can make is immense right. So, yeah, but, but what is very nice is you can actually solve this using linear programming in a very clean you know clean way. Okay. So, as I was saying there are two pos these are two different problems. First problem is that of uh, uh, the, the earlier problem which is the maximum flow problem is about sending the maximum flow over capacity constraint in uh, network okay. that is about finding the bottleneck this problem is there is no bottleneck you can set as much flow as you like right but the which links will you choose is the question because the uh, the links that you will choose you will uh, based on the links you will choose you will incur a cost yes. okay so now so since since the cost and the cost here we will uh, 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 what we will do is say let us say uh, uh, okay let me let me uh, let me write this in this sort of way now suppose just imagine suppose i had one unit of flow entering s just one unit okay some one unit of goods say one truck or whatever uh, one unit of goods let's not one truck one unit of goods entering node s and which has to reach uh, node t okay so it enters uh, enters here and leaves and has to reach reach uh, reach t when it when a, whenever this this flow one unit of flow reaches any particular node say it reaches this node i it has a decision to there is a decision we need to make which is 
that out of all the links that are going out from node i, which one should I pick. Now, suppose at node i, I have these links which have which have cost say 10, 20 and 30. These are the costs of the links, not capacity, costs of the links, which okay. and suppose from I know that from here, let us say for simplicity, from here this is the this is the cost that I would incur uh, say if I if I came if I if I came here and then from here if I had to go all the way till Delhi here is suppose the cost I would incur. Someone told me this number that here is the cost I would incur if I came here. I so if I came to node I and I chose this particular uh, this particular link it would cost me 20 to get to Delhi if I chose this particular link, it would cost me 10 to get to Delhi, the other one would cost me 30 to get to Delhi, okay. not just to the next node, I am taking suppose all the way till Delhi okay, for simplicity. In that case, how, where would you send your flow? You would send the flow onto the one that is that has the least possible co least cost of all of these, right. Naturally, the reason is because the links do not have any capacity constraint. There is no reason for you when the flow arrives at a particular node. There is no reason for you to split the flow across multiple edges. You would auto, you will always pick the one that uh, the pick the one that that has the least possible cost to reach the destination from there onward, isn't it? So this this simple observation is all uh, all that we actually need here. Okay. So let us write uh, let us write out the some variables and I will explain to you how this this works out. Okay. So suppose suppose x i j. So suppose I uh, I am sending. So imagine flow 1 into node s okay so you send a unit flow into node s let xij be the flow on i to j, on link ij x i j be the flow on link i j. So, what is the objective in expressed in terms of x i j? Suppose uh, I had a uh, if I have so if I am sending flow x i j on link i j ok what what uh, we will use this interpretation and it will later turn out that this is actually correct. So, we will we will have this interpretation that this is equal to 0 if i comma j is not on the chosen path and one otherwise. So, it will turn out that if it is not on the shortest path, then i x i j would be 0, which means that it will not send any flow on that. And if it is on the shortest path, it will have to send the full flow on it. So, the reason for that is exactly what I just said. See, whenever a full the flow arises ar arrives at a particular node, if it you look at the path the, the, the cost that it has to incur to get to the final destination and the path that will give you the least possible cost, the entire flow will go on to that path. It has to be. So, if at all a flow is there on a path, that path must have must be the one that encounters the least cost. It cannot be that part of it is there here, part of it is there, is, is, is part of it is there in a, on another part, right. So, so now let x i j be the flow on, on link i j and it, we will it will have the we will take this interpretation that it will be 0 if i j is on the uh, is not on the chosen path and one otherwise. So, so the objective is to simply then in the in these terms is to minimize 
this. So, what is this? This is the total cost of a chosen chosen path. And now, all I need to make sure is that these, these flows satisfy my flow conservation constraints. So, I look at x j. So, my flow conservation constraints again my inflow is sum over j such that i j belongs to E. This is the inflow inflow into i. Then I have a sum over j I and this is not i j, this should be j i belongs to E. This is i j belongs to E, this is and this should be equal, this is 1 if i is the source node, 0 if i is neither the source node nor the destination node and minus 1 if i is the if i is the uh, is the destination is this correct sorry my mistake here sorry this should be the other way around this should be minus 1 here yeah yeah that's correct so my uh, so it, this should be minus 1 if i is the source node because uh, so the that positive one inflow into i so that's that's correct so it's minus one this would be it would be zero at all nodes except for the source node and destination node and it would be equal to one at the outflow node and we have that x i j is greater than or equal to zero so what have we done we've taken a problem of shortest path and of find which was about which was about trying to enumerate all the possible paths in the network and trying to find the shortest path and we have converted it into a problem of finding of minimizing the cost of flow. We said let us imagine a unit flow that was sent in, if a unit flow was sent in and it had to fa follow my flow conservation equations, right? what would be the path it would choose. It is almost like you know you, you are sending a flow of water and it is trying to find the path of least, least resistance or least. Uh, 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 to uh, to go from a particular uh, destin source to a destination, right? You solve this, and it will it turns out that this actually gives you the shortest path. Okay, so this is this is a linear programming formulation of a pro problem that, on the face of it, looks extremely complicated. Just you know, if you had to enumerate all the possible paths, would uh, would be a horrendously complicated problem. But knowing the uh, knowing the, uh, uh, but, but but with this sort of way of looking at it, we are able to reduce it to a linear program form. Okay. There are many other such problems that uh, that uh, that end up getting reduced to uh, get uh, get end up re reduced to linear programming. That is why linear programming is such a is an such an extremely powerful uh, powerful tool across all of uh, all of engineering and uh, engineering and science. All right. So, with this we, we conclude our, our, uh, our study of linear programming. What I have not touched upon at all is algorithms for linear programming because I uh, plan to come to that next. But what, the, what I want you to remember the biggest takeaway I want you to remember from linear programming is, is linear programming duality and associated Farkash lemma. Okay. So, Farkash lemma is something that we will, we will use again. And in one shot, you will see how that gives us also optimality conditions for any type of uh, convex optimization problem. Okay, so that is uh, that would be next on the agenda. Okay. 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 The form of Farkash, there is another form of. Let me mention this also. So there is another form of Farkash lemma that which will which we will. Different form which will be very useful in the in the next lecture so it says so let a in 
R m cross n and C belong to R m. Then the following statements are equivalent. for all x such that a x is less than equal to 0, we have c transpose x less than equal to 0. C. For all x such that a x is less than equal to 0, we have c transpose x less than equal to 0. And then there exists a lambda greater than equal to the other statement. So, the Farkash lemma is saying that there are two statements that are equivalent. The first statement is that for all x such that a x is less than equal to 0, we must have c transpose x less than equal to 0. The second statement is that there exists a lambda greater than equal to 0. Uh, so, lambda is in R m in R m. lambda greater than equal to 0 such that a transpose lambda equals c. So, this statement is essentially uh, this this version of Farkash lemma is a different form of, uh, of of stating in Farkash lemma. This is not stating it in the form of two statements out of which only one can be true rather it is saying that these two are equivalent. These are two equivalent ways of saying the same thing one is that for all x such that a x is less than equal to 0, we have c transpose x less than equal to 0. The other is saying that uh, there always is a lambda greater than equal to 0 such that a transpose lambda is equal to c. Right? So, what this basically is uh, if you look at the second statement, what it is saying is that it says is that c is in the cone generated by the columns of a transpose c is, uh, uh, can, uh, in, uh, is present in the cone generated by the columns of A transpose. So, you can always find a conic combination of the columns of uh, A transpose such that the, that conic combination equals c. Okay. The, fir the first statement says something completely different. It says that A x is whenever A x is less than equal to 0, it has to be that c transpose x is also less than equal to 0. Okay. So, a, columns of A transpose is uh, a, a, uh, if you consider a cone formed by the columns of A transpose that contains C, that is one statement. The other statement says that if you look at the uh, if you look at vectors x such that uh, such that A x is less than equal to 0, then they must make an uh, obtuse or uh, greater than equal to 90 degree angle with C c transpose x less than equal to 0 and these it turns out these two are actually equivalent. Okay. So, this is this is another form of Farkash lemma and we will uh, this again can be uh, proved using linear programming duality. Again you have to con think of the right sort of linear program look at its dual and again you will be able to argue it from there. In fact, you may even be able to prove linear programming duality itself from linear pro from this particular Farkash lemma. So, uh, without you know going through uh, perpetrating hyperplanes and so on. So, a first principles proof of this Farkash lemma would be as hard as LP duality itself. Okay. All right. So, we uh, important thing the reason I mention is now is that remember this we will use this uh, in a definitive way in the next class. Okay. So, we will end this.